Welcome to the Walt Whitman Show. Welcome to Ireland. Welcome to all of you. Welcome to those of you watching on the web, those of you who are here in the app. Welcome. This is the Walt Whitman Show, much later than usual. Hello, Mike. Nice to see you. So you're very welcome. Hello, Susan. Very nice to see you too. And this is the book of poetry which Walt Whitman produced all his life, updated it, edited it. Ollie, good morning. Good morning. You're glad to see me sober, right? Susan, thank you for inviting people. Very good of you. Very good of you. Let me say hello to you guys. Hello. Yeah. So I'm, um, this is probably about three hours later than usual. Yes, it's, uh, I've been out this evening and I've been uh, playing poker. So I've just returned. So he'll end. Did I see you there? So I'm going to, um, I thought, well, we are going to have a Walt Whitman show today. And uh, it'll be a bit unusual, but we're still going to have our daily, our daily um, helping of poetry by Walt Whitman. And for those of you who don't know much about, this is his photograph shortly before he died in 1892 and um, slowly, gradually, day by day, um, the Walt Whitman show is uh, reading. We're going to read all of this book, the whole lot of it, with an aim to eventually read every bit of poetry written by Walt Whitman from the beginning of Leaves of Grass. So with... Let me just get myself ready for reading. The uh, Dicks out dar... Goodness knows what that means. I hope you enjoyed my sick... Oh, I felt for you. I really did feel for you, Marissa. I did. That that must have been such a strain on your voice. My goodness, to sing while you were in such a with such a cold. It was really good of you though. I loved it. I loved it. Really did. So we have another song from Walt Whitman. Song of the Broad Axe. And I'm going to read you a bit of it. David Atchison, Party World. You're up terribly late, David. It's not as bad as laryngitis, yeah. I know, it was lovely. I could, uh, well, you know, I could never have enough uh, operatic singing. So this... Um, this poem has got 12 parts to it, and I'm going to read you part three. It's a fairly long part. So, with no more ado, and except for sorting out the, the camera, let me just get you, sort you out there for a second. I want to, uh, I like to give you the most, the best of you. So what I'm going to do is read from Walt Whitman and depending on how long it takes, I'm going to read the same piece of poetry twice because I think it takes twice for a poem to start to sink in. So last night we had parts, or well, yeah, yesterday we had parts one and two. And tonight we're going to 
we're going to get to part three. So, just have a little drop of cold tea. And start. Part three of Song of the Broad Axe by Walt Whitman. The log at the wood pile, the axe supported by it, the sylvan hut, the vine over the doorway, the space cleared for a garden, the irregular tapping of rain down on the leaves after the storm is lulled, the wailing and moaning at intervals, the thought of the sea, the thought of ships struck in the storm, and put on their beam ends, and the cutting away of masts. The sentiment of the huge timbers, of old-fashioned houses and barns. The remembered print or narrative, the voyage at a venture of men, families, goods. The disembarkation the founding of a new city. The voyage of those who sought a new England and found it, the, out, the outset anywhere. The settlements of the Arkansas, Colorado, Ottawa, Willamette, the slow progress the scant fare, the axe, rifle, saddlebags, the beauty of all adventurous and daring persons, the beauty of wood boys and wood men with their clear, untrimmed faces, the beauty of independence, departure, action that relies on themselves, the American contempt for statutes and ceremonies, the boundless impatience of restraint, the loose drift of character, the inkling through random types, the solidification, the butcher in the slaughterhouse, the hands of board schooners and sloops, the raftsman, the pioneer. Lumbermen in their winter camp, daybreak in the woods, strips of snow on the limbs of trees, the occasional snapping, the glad, clear sound of one's own voice, the merry song, the natural life of the woods, the strong day's work. The blazing fire at night, the sweet taste of supper, the talk, the bed of hemlock boughs, and the bare skin. The house builder at work in cities or anywhere, the preparatory joining, jointing, squaring, sawing, mortising, the hoist up of beams, the push of them in their places, laying them regular, setting the studs by their tenons on the mortises according as they were prepared, the blows of mallets and hammers, the attitudes of the men, their curved limbs, bending, standing, astride the beams, driving in pins, holding on by posts and braces, the hooked arm over the planks, close to be nailed. Sorry, the hooked arm over the plate, the other arm wielding the axe, the floor men forcing the planks close to the nailed, their postures bringing their weapons 
downward on the bearers, the echoes resounding through the vacant building, the huge storehouse carried up in the city well under the way, the six framing men, two in the middle and two at each end, carefully bearing on their shoulders a heavy stick for a crossbeam, the crowded line of masons with trowels in their right hands, rapidly laying the long side wall two hundred feet from front to rear, the flexible rise and fall of backs, the continual click of the trowels striking the bricks, the bricks one after another, each laid so workmanlike in its place and set with a knock of the trowel handle, the pile of materials, the mortar on the mortar boards and the steady replenishing by the hod men, spar makers in the spar yard, the swarming row of well-grown apprentices, the swing of their axes on the square hewed log shaping it towards the shape of a mast. The brisk, short crackle of the steel driven slantingly into the pine, the butter-coloured chips flying off in great flakes and slivers. The limber motion of brawny young arms and hips in easy costumes the constructor of wharves, bridges, piers, bulkheads, floats, stays against the sea. The city fireman, the fire that suddenly bursts forth in the close-packed square. The arriving engines, the hoarse shouts, the nimble stepping and daring, the strong command through the fire trumpets, the falling in line, the rise and fall of the arms forcing the water, the slender, spasmic, blue-white jets, the bringing to bear of the hooks and ladders and their execution, the crash and cut away of connecting woodwork or through doors if the fire, smother, if the fire smoulders under them the crowd with their lit faces watching, the glare and the dense shadows, the forger at his forge furnace and the user of iron after him, the maker of the axe, large and small, and the welder and temperer, the closer breathing his breath on the cold steel and trying the edge with his thumb, the one who clean shapes the handle and sets it firmly in the socket, the shadowy processions of the portraits of the past users also, the primal patient mechanics, the architects and engineers, the far off Assyrian edifice and Misra edifice, the Roman lictors preceding the counts, consuls, the antique European warrior with his axe in combat, the uplifted arm, the clatter of blows on the helmeted head, the death howl, the limp sea, tumbling body, the rush of a friend and foe thither, the siege of revolted lieges determined for liberty the summons to surrender the battering of castle gates the truce and parley the sack of an old city in its time the bursting in of mercenaries and bigots tumultuously and disorderly roar flames blood drunkenness madness, goods freely rifled from houses and temples, screams of women in the grip 
of brigands, craft and thievery of camp followers, men running, old persons despairing, the hell of war, the cruelties of decrees, the list of all executive deeds and words, just or unjust, the power of personality, just or unjust. So there, there you have part four of Song of the Broad Axe, sorry, part three of Song of the Broad Axe by Walt Whitman. Thank you very much, Susan. Thank you very much, Ollie. Yes, it's, there's a lot in there. There's a, a lot in there. And a lot about building houses and a lot about bricklayers and hod carriers and Yeah, spa makers. It's huge detail, isn't it? I mean, you can see the journalist's eye for detail all over the place in Whitman. I mean, I don't think it's easily found in other places. Must have been the longest. Mm. David, I'm not sure. I think my brain is dying, to be honest. I think my brain is definitely... Uh, and Walt Whitman was a man of descriptive detail. He really was. He uh, gave a lot of little pen pictures of scenes, really. I mean, the floor men forcing the planks close, close to be nailed. Part 33 of Song of Myself. It, oh, it could well be, yeah. Um, part 33 of Song of Myself. Um, let me just have a look at that, because that's, uh, yeah. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's ten pages in the book. Energize gusto. Yes, yes, I am. Um, I love the work. I'm running on what would you call it? Reserve fuel tank. Um, you're quite right. Part thirty-three of Song of Myself is longer. And uh, yeah, it's there's a lot. It's a whole load of little pictures. The city fireman. The fire that suddenly bursts forth in the close-packed square. The arriving engines, the hoarse shouts, the nimble stepping and daring, the strong command through the fire trumpets, the falling in line, the rise and fall of the arms, forcing the water, the slender, spasmic, Blue white jets, the bringing to bear of the hooks and ladders and their execution, the crash and cut away of connecting woodwork are through floors if the fire smoulders under them. So that's great detail. Great detail. And that's a point, like a film treatment. Yeah, I don't know much about film treatments. I've never written one myself, but you can see it. You can take any one of these lines out of context and, you know, put it in a different context. So you could, we could get somebody Excuse me, I'm sorry. I feel myself to be completely incoherent. I don't know what I'm saying. I'm a shadow of my former self. I'm exhausted. It's, uh, this isn't an excuse. It's two o'clock in the morning and 
I'm afraid I can't get my head around saying very much. I'm, uh, yeah, I could. But, you know, I would have found it very difficult to go off to bed without being able to at least explain where I was. I forgot to tell you all last night that I would be playing poker tonight. I just forgot. And I suppose I could have sent you all a tweet or put some tweets out there during the day. But again, I forgot. And then, of course, I, I hate um, changing things at the last minute. So, anyway, that's just my stuff. And, you know, it's, it's lovely to know that a number of you keep keeping me company. Your brothers texted you <coughs> constantly. It's wonderful to have brothers who text you con constantly. I have three brothers and none of them test text me con consistently. Hello, Meg Veg. Hello, good evening. Welcome. I'm just sitting here with my head propped up. Anyway, when do you scope tomorrow? Well, if you're referring to scope day, I'm not featured on scope day. I, I, I'm not associated with scope day at all. Um, I'm intrigued to know what it's going to be like. I haven't studied who's, uh, who's, who are the selected featured artists yet. You Google some flights and driving distance in Ireland for preparation for visiting in the near future. Whoopee! Oh, that's lovely to hear. I would be delighted to meet you and take you for coffee and help in any way if, if you needed any help in relation to getting around Ireland. Oh, yeah. And we could do some scopes together. Ah. You can hit everything within the two-week trip you're considering. Right. The person who came to Ireland who used to be pretty active here on Periscope, but she doesn't use it anymore, was Susan Bowen Photo. And I met her in Kinsale. And she's a lovely person. Um, we, we spent a few hours together. So, ah, back to the poem. I like how the axe is a character for Walt, as the moleskin is a character for me. It's true, actually, that's quite an interesting... Well, that's a very attractive observation, I must say, Andrew. Yeah, the axe is a character. Yeah. The maker of the axe, large and small, and the welderer and temperer. The chooser breathing his breath on the cold steel and trying the edge with his thumb. The one who clean shapes the handle and sets it firmly in the socket. Yeah, it's, um, it's good stuff. Um, if you, if you ever get a chance to see, you know, a traditional way of making, making an axe, I highly recommend it. You know, the way axes were made in quote, the old days. But there is, um, no, I don't know what I was going to say. Here, come here, pussy, come here. Rescue me.
my brain is my brain is losing out hmm? I took him to the vet today because he's got a got a very strange uh, white patch behind his ear in fact it's come here will you show the people your 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 ear let's just show you the ear come on come on don't know if you can see now he's got a little something a little something there yeah there's some hair missing and uh, the yes he's just started to go out very recently like in the last few days he's now sitting on top of the keyboard and um, the vet didn't didn't know what it was she hadn't she just didn't know what it was she said it wasn't ringworm she said he he's not scratching himself well i told her that and he doesn't scratch himself so she's asked me to bring him in on Monday at nine o'clock in the morning on Monday for observation. So they're going to take you in. They're going to take you in and observe you. You know, Susan, that's a very interesting point. Because my wife asked me the same question. Maybe two. That's about the funniest thing I've heard in a long time. Too much sun. That's the thought of Ireland having too much sun is kind of really amusing. Um, anyway, this uh, little fella here is a uh, Cats get cancer too readily, too. Oh my goodness. Well, I know they get it, but I didn't know, you know, you can't get cancer at this stage of your life. You use, Puma doesn't look, didn't look too enthralled going to the vet in that photograph. No, he was a bit, um, well, he was going somewhere strange and he was, being pulled around the place by somebody is it bright or dull it's um it's dull it's it's dull really i wouldn't say it was bright i was going to show it to you if i can but not as easy as it looks in fact i can show it to you i can of course show it to you let me just do this this way you have Doctor, hello, Puma. Now let me just show you. See, can you see that there now? Can you see that? I think you can. I think you can. Yes, 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 yes. yes. You just want to. You just want to know, Puma. Here, have a look. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to give Puma a view of. Here you are, Puma. Look, look. What's that? Hmm? Yeah, very handsome. Now here is, here is a puma sitting on Walt Whitman. This is puma, or that was puma, sitting on Walt Whitman. Now, Will you, um, funny cat? Okay. It's too much like yours, and it was an allergy on... Ah, you know what? My wife asked me, could it be an allergy? Could it be a reaction to some new food that he's been having? I said I hadn't a clue. It hadn't crossed my mind that, you know, it could be an allergy. But... Anyway, I've got to bring him back on Monday. So we hopefully will find out on Monday. What's wrong with you, little Puma? You know, 
I about the only thing I can really talk about at, at the moment is Puma. Do you have poison ivy here? No, don't think so. I'm not a hundred percent sure, but he couldn't get it from eating bamboo leaves, could he? Yes, I do have four oak trees in the garden, four oak trees. But he's hardly been out at all. Like he had this um, on his ear before he was ever let out. And he's just been let out for short amounts of time this, this week. So look, 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 I think I should really, really and truly Oh, Lars, did you see Lars's scope today with Bacon and Nelly on the scope? Did you see, did you see that scope? That was a gem, wasn't it? And Nelly, you know, yeah, fantastically good publicity. Oh, you, you should look it up. It, it really is a lovely piece. Um, right, well, if you get a chance, you know where you can find it. I'm pretty certain that Lars's stuff is probably saved on catch. I can't be 100% sure. But anyway, I am going to say goodnight to you all. And to those of you who are, um, who've seen me for the first time tonight, I'm not always this tired. Hello, Salt Lake City. Hello. Yes, that was pretty astonishing. Oh, for a dog or a cat, that was uh, almost as... <laughs> this is terrible. Look, I'm going to say goodnight to you all. I'm going to say goodnight. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night, Susan. Good night, Kathy. Um, good night, Anne, who's Ashleen. Good night, uh, Rich. Oh, yeah, Saratosa. Good night. Good night. Russell's verse. Good night to you. Good night. So I, I must go gently, gentle. I must go gentle into that good night. Hey, good night. Okay, I'm going to close down now. Bye. Bye-bye, and thank you very much for your company. Bye-bye.